Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, Dr. Horowitz, uh, and hello to everybody that's watching this a little later on. It's the day before Christmas in Australia, if you're watching this in the next few days. And my name is Sharon Whiteman, and I'm part of the board team at the Lyme Disease Association of Australia. I've been involved since its first meeting when it was birthed in 2009, and I guess um, I'm driven by injustice. So my background is, is that I'm a mom. <clears throat> I'm a former clinical nurse specialist in critical care. I got bit by a tick on the Sunshine Coast in Australia uh, in 2002. I had an immediate severe flu and an EM rash and didn't connect that to my decline into disability over the next three years. And when I realized through hard fighting myself, like so many people would identify, I, I self-diagnosed and I've never really had effective treatment and you know I'm alive today out of sheer grit and fighting and trying everything. We put our uh, came together to try and make a difference for all sick Australians and today we're going to talk with Dr. Horowitz. He's the Lyme Disease Association of Australia's patron and if you haven't had the pleasure to know anything about Dr. Horowitz I'll just give you a little bit of his background. Dr. Horowitz is a board certified internist and the medical director of the Hudson Valley Healing Arts Center, an integrative medical center, which combines both classical and complementary approaches in the treatment of Lyme disease and other tick-borne disorders. He has treated over 13,000 chronic Lyme disease patients in the last 30 years, with patients coming from all over the US, Canada, and Europe to his clinic. He is former assistant director of medicine of Vassar Brothers Hospital in Plowkeepsie, Plow New York, and is one of the founding members and past president-elect of the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society. He is also a past president of the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Education Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the healthcare professionals, to education of healthcare professionals on tick-borne diseases. He's co-authored peer-reviewed Lyme guidelines. He's trained over 100 healthcare providers in diagnosing and caring for patients with treatment-resistant tick born disorders. He was previously awarded Humanitarian of the Year Award by the Turn the Corner Foundation for his treatment of Lyme disease and he's dedicated his life to helping those stricken with this devastating disease. Now I quote Dr. Horowitz um, from a few years ago. He says this is a worldwide epidemic that's not even accounting for the other Borrelia species like Borrelia Miyamoto, the new relapsing, relapsing fever spirochete. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on the situation in Australia. We wanna know, we wanna let patients know in Australia who are doing it very tough and who are losing hope that the, the world is watching and that they know what's going on and that they're speaking up on behalf of us. So Dr. Horowitz, let's just quickly go back to how, how did you get involved with treating Lyme disease and, and what's your passion for this particular very difficult to treat um, syndrome, I mean, it's not a syndrome, but group of diseases, infections. So um, my start in Lyme disease happened when I moved to the Hudson Valley, New York, which is about two hours north of New York City. I had done my training in uh, Queens, where I grew up. And um, when I came up to the Hudson Valley, Vassar Brothers Hospital was inviting me up, helping me to open up a medical office. I just didn't realize I was walking into one of the largest Lyme endemic areas in the United States. In fact, Dutchess County, New York, where I am at the time, I think was just about number one. And um, you know, one of the things you learn as an internist is, of course, to take a proper history and do a differential diagnosis. And very shortly after I got up there, I started seeing patients with erythema migrans rashes. I went to the medical literature, you know, 30 days of an antibiotic was supposed to cure it. And although about 75 or 80 percent did get better, there was a certain number of these patients who did not get better. And, you know, the job of a physician, of course, is to get patients better. So I just started looking through the medical literature and going to conferences, reading the literature. And um, it's now led me over 30 years later to um, recently having served for Health and Human Services for the U.S. government on the uh, HHS Tick-Borne Disease Working Group. I was one of the public members uh, working with the CDC, the NIH, the FDA, and the Department of Defense. Um, I was also co-chair of the other Tick-Borne Infections and Co-Infections Subcommittee. Um, and this year also, they re-elected me to serve on the Babesian Tick-Borne Virus Subcommittee. So I, I'm still working for Health and Human Services. And one disclaimer I need to tell everyone is that everything you're about to hear from me um, is not necessarily sanctioned by HHS, the United States, or the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group. These are my opinions um, and do not reflect that particular organization. Thank you. And 
So what drives you? Like, I think that you probably, I suspect you are everywhere across the globe. What drives you and what do you see as the foundation of that? So when I was finishing medical school, I went to one of my teachers and I said to him, um, what is the most important thing I need to know when I get out of medical school? And he said, Richard, the most important thing is to exchange yourself, put yourself in other people's positions and do for them what you would want done for yourself or for your family members. I and mean, it's a very simple way of thinking about things from a philosophical standpoint. Um, and then when I started seeing these sick patients, um, I started thinking about this and saying, well, gee, they're, they're not getting better. I've sent them to infectious disease. I've sent them to neurology. It's my job. They're not getting better. And what would I want done, right, if I wasn't getting better? Uh, I would want a doctor fighting for me and figuring out what's going on. And that's essentially what I've been doing for the past 30 years is trying to figure out this very complex illness. Um, and it certainly led me down pathways that I would not have expected, uh, creating the 16-point MSIDS model, which was just over the years discovering that it wasn't just Lyme disease, it was also co-infections like Babesia and Bartonella, mycoplasma species making people sick. Um, there were a lot of immune problems, not just autoimmunity, but immune deficiencies that show up in a lot of these patients. Um, we see a lot of environmental toxins with mercury, with lead. Um, we know that there's hundreds of chemicals getting into people's bodies, which cause them to be ill. Um, and then we would find things like downstream effects of the infections, like they couldn't hold the blood pressure with POTS dysautonomia. Uh, they might have mitochondrial dysfunction. The hormones get disrupted. All of these are like secondary effects of having these infections with Lyme. And unfortunately, um, it's quite complex. And unless you know where to look for the answers, um, these patients are going to stay ill. So um, it's led me down a journey, really an unexpected journey over the years. And I think in the last 10 years, I've probably made some of the greatest um, advancements that I have in figuring things out, which is basically thanks to all the researchers through John Hopkins University, through Stanford University, through uh, Dr. Shapi at University of New Haven, Kim Lewis. These are all the doctors that basically have discovered the biofilm forms of Borrelia, uh, persister forms. These were not forms that we knew existed a decade ago. And with some of these new treatments, we've definitely seen improvements, including my wife now, who's two years symptom free uh, after suffering for over 30 years. So um, we're making progress. And you know, I, I'm sorry for Australia and some of the patients that are still suffering. Of course, I've seen some of the Australian and New Zealand patients who come to see me. And it is, it's a very difficult political situation when you have a government that doesn't believe at all that you've got um, Lyme disease in your country. Um, they know, of course, that people travel, they're all aware of it, um, but you know, they, they sit on these medical boards and they look at the conflicting evidence and they say, gee, there's just not a good, uh, not enough scientific evidence, yet there's Australians getting erythema migrans rashes in the country who are there after a tick bite, as you've just explained for yourself, Sharon. And in the medical literature, you see the same thing. I looked at some of the Australian medical literature and they clearly describe patients who've not left Australia, get erythema migrans rashes, and they've even cultured out and shown by PCR that there are Borrelia species making them sick. So there's evidence there, but as everything in medicine, things kind of advance slowly in certain areas. Um, there clearly are controversies. Um, so I think that uh, you know, more money, more science, both sides sitting down at the table is always for me a solution because whenever you have controversies, you've got to bring everyone to the table. You've got to bring the infectious disease doctors, the health departments, uh, doctors like myself that treat with the ILAD standpoint. You just need everybody sitting at the table, looking at the medical literature, talking about our clinical experience. I, I think if you don't hold these kind of conferences, and I don't just meet one day, I'm talking, this would probably be a week long conference at least. Um, with researchers from all over the world coming and participating, whether by Skype or Zoom or in person, I think it's the only way you're really going to kind of work this out. You, you've got to get the best and the brightest minds together in a room and mm. figure this out because there are a lot of controversies that do exist. And so you've been consulting to the Australian government probably since 2012 now, correct? Yes. That's correct. And so there was an attempt in the Clinical Advisory Committee into Lyme disease to have that kind of form of bringing global experts and local experts together. What's your viewpoint on, on the failure of that or the, how it was stalled? You know, unfortunately, so I, I had done a submission for the Australian government, and I forget exactly the number of pages, but it probably was at least 30 pages long um, in a PDF, which explained the problems with testing and the problems with persistence. And... Um, there's a lot of literature that 
with all of these different Borrelia species, you can't really expect that the standard two-tier testing of an ELISA followed by a Western blot is going to pick up all these Sensulatu species. It, it just doesn't. And in fact, they found years ago, for example, in Scotland, if they used the Borrelia species from the country and they did a Western blot using those species, they increase uh, the specificity and the sensitivity of picking it up. So um, I did submit the data on this. I submitted the problems with the testing, the significance, um, the fact that it can persist. I mean, if anyone knows about persistence, it's myself, who's seen over 13,000 of these patients in the last 30 years. Um, uh, you know, I, I laugh when I listen to these other doctors saying there's no evidence. There's huge amounts of evidence that Borrelia persists. That is more of a political standpoint. That's not a medical viewpoint. Um, the, the majority of the medical evidence is that it persists. When the doctors go back and say, well, there's three NIH studies that show it, you know, it doesn't persist because rocephin or doxycycline didn't work, I basically say to them, well, you didn't really know about biofilms and persister forms at the time when you did these studies. None of these patients were treated adequately for co-infections, and the majority of my population has co-infections, especially Babesia uh, and Bartonella species. So, you know, there were flaws, and not it was their fault, but at the time when these studies were done, we didn't have the information that we have now. So one of the things, I, I recently submitted a grant application um, to do a triple-blind, placebo-controlled, multi-center Dapsone trial, because we've been finding that um, high-dose Dapsone for some patients who are not co-infected looks like it has a clinical cure, and it's an eight-week protocol. It's just eight weeks with oral, generic drugs, no IV. It's not expensive to do. There are side effects that you have to watch for, uh, but we've learned how to deal with them over the years. And at this point, that for me would help to resolve some of the scientific controversies if we had this prospective, not retrospective, but prospective multi-center, uh, triple-blinded placebo-controlled trial. I think it would answer the questions, um, does it persist? Because a lot of these patients are getting better and staying in remission. Um, I was at the ILADS conference about two months ago in Boston. And before I got up to speak on stage, someone gave me an index card uh, before I got up on the stage and said, Dr. Horowitz, thank you. I did the double dose Dapsone protocol and I'm one year in remission. And I turned around and it was the first person I ever put on Dapsone a couple of years back. And this person had suffered for 41 years. She got sick when she was 10 years old. And I gave her the Dapsone protocol, the higher dose when she was 51. She's now one year out for the first time in 41 years that she has no symptoms. So that's amazing. And my wife was sick for over 30 years. She's two years out with no symptoms. Um, I saw a young gentleman yesterday in my medical office. He was treated with antibiotics before he saw me from ages four to 18. Um, he was on antibiotics straight through for all of those years, for 14 years. He did the double dose Dapsone protocol for two months. He's now a year and a half. He has no symptoms. So we are finding answers. And I clearly, I will be publishing some of these studies on the double dose Dapsone next year. That's part of what I'd like to do for the medical literature. But we are finding answers. But you, know, you need the governments to work with doctors like us. The problem is, is that a lot of these really brilliant doctors who work at the governmental level, whether it's at the NIH or the Australian Department of Health, you've got to work with the clinicians who are in the trenches. Because otherwise, all you're doing is you're reading medical literature in journals, trying to get a sense of what reality is. But that's like saying, I know what a war is like if you've never been on a battlefield. You don't know what a war is like. You've got to see these patients yourself. You've got to look at the medical records. So um, I think there's just a disconnect where there has not been enough integration from the bottom, from doctors like myself that are in the trenches for over 30 years, with all of these people in the ivory towers who work in academic institutions who only just you know, publish or read the literature, but who don't actually see patients themselves. And we really need it at all levels. And I think that's gonna be part of the solution and it's probably gonna be part of the solution in Australia. Um, but I think Australian doctors are scared at this point because many of the countries around the world have sanctioned doctors. Um, I know they've done it in France. I know it's happened in Australia. It's happened in, um, in some of the Norwegian countries. So. It's, it's a problem. You've got a spreading global epidemic, and a lot of the world governments um, are following the CDC. Um, and unfortunately, if you actually read the CDC website in the last 10 years, it will say Lyme disease is a clinical diagnosis that this two-tier testing is primarily for health departments to epidemiologically screen large populations. It's never meant to make a clinical diagnosis. But the problem, again, you have in Australia 
is you're basically just using these two-tier testing to say, okay, these people um, don't have Lyme disease because they don't have a, an ELISA followed by an IgG Western blot with five bands. So um, we now know that the two-tier testing has a sensitivity and specificity of you know, roughly a coin flip. So um, there needs to be much more funding that's going to be put into better testing and not just the B31 strain, which is a lab strain, but all these different Sensulatu species that are showing up and the ones that are showing up in Australia. You know, you've got Borrelia species in Australia that you just need better genetic testing to identify them. Um, I, again, I looked at the literature before I got on this call today with you, and you know, I could read some of the, the highlights that I pulled out of the literature for you, but when you read the highlights of the literature of what's actually published in Australia, the overwhelming majority of this evidence tells you, yeah, you've got a Lyme disease organism that is showing up in Australia. And, including even Borrelia gurinii, which causes neuroborreliosis in Europe. Um, the seabirds are carrying different Borrelia species, and they're even finding that um, not just ticks, but other species like heads and mites and lice are transmitting some of these other organisms, not just Bartonella species. So there's a lot more we have to learn, but you obviously need to have an interest. You have to have the time, the expertise, and money right, with an open mind, and I always love saying an open mind doesn't mean your brain's going to fall out. You have to have an open mind with compassion for these sick and suffering patients and saying, we are going to figure this out, right? That's the only way you're going to get to the bottom of this. Thank you, Dr. H. And you, you've, again, looking from a global perspective, you've advised to multiple governments. Is, is, do you see anything unique about our situation in Australia? I mean, the one thing that's unique is that every other country in the world pretty much has said, oh yes, we have you know, Lyme disease in our country. Australia is like the only one at this point that's saying, no, the migratory birds, they don't bring, they bring ticks everywhere else. They somehow don't get across the border in Australia. Um, and you know, maybe it's a relapsing fever Borrelia. We don't know at this point, but um, it's the only country in the world that basically has said that we don't have Lyme disease. Every other country in the world has it. And what do you think is the global prevalence and what do you think is the impact on the healthcare dollar for governments um, facing this pandemic, really? Um, what, do you, what do you think of the numbers? Well, you know, the, the problem with figuring out the real prevalence of this is that Lyme disease is known as the great imitator, just like syphilis was years ago. So, for example, in the United States, if you're trying to figure out the real prevalence, um, years ago, the CDC said, oh, it's 10 times higher than we suspected. It's not 30,000, but over 300,000. The last figures from 2017-18 was actually closer to 600,000. Um, and even then, it still probably is underestimating it. Why? Because you're still basically looking at two-tiered testing, which we know is going to miss half of the patients. Um, so when you look, for example, at the U.S., three to 4% of the US population at least has been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. So what are the symptoms of chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia? I have chronic fatigue, I have joint and muscle pain, I have headaches, my memory's not working, I can't fall asleep, and I have POTS dysautonomia. Well, that sounds exactly like Lyme disease. So again, how many of these millions of people, it's like 11, 12 million people in the US, have, who have been diagnosed with chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia of unknown etiology, how many of these might have Borreliosis or have co-infections? Probably a lot. And the ones that don't have Lyme probably have Babesia or Bartonella or probably have other co-infections. Um, even in, this, in the um, parts of the US, for example, the Midwest, they found 10% of these chronic fatigue patients have brucellosis um, you know, from cattle and other things. So there's probably a lot of other bacteria, viruses, parasites that are making people sick. But so I think we have millions of people in the U.S. with that diagnosis who have not been told they have Lyme. You're looking at 46 million Americans who've been diagnosed with preclinical dementia. So that's like 15% of the U.S. population has been told that you are going to go on to dementia at some point in the future. And what's disturbing for me is that nobody at the top governmental levels are going, oh my God, 46 million people with preclinical dementia, and we know that Lyme disease, Borrelia burgdorferi, is being found in, under biofilms in Alzheimer's patients. Now, they are finding other things. They're finding chlamydia and ammonia. They're finding Helicobacter pylori. They're finding herpes virus 1, herpes virus 2, herpes virus 6, 7, and 8. They're finding a whole bunch of things, even pesticides. But the point being, how can you as a government look at the number of people who are coming down with dementia-like illness and saying, we don't know? 
That's not acceptable. If I was running the government and I was head of one of the health departments, I would say, gee, we need to put a lot more money and resources to figure this out because a large number of our people are going to be disabled in years to come. And then you look at autoimmune diseases. In the US, 23 million Americans have been diagnosed with autoimmune diseases. Well, we know Borrelia burgdorferi is in part responsible for autoimmunity, as is environmental toxins. And I just published an editorial on this just a couple of weeks ago um, in Scientific Archives, if people want to take a look at it. So when you look at the prevalence, the problem is Lyme is a great imitator. So you're looking at chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia and autoimmune diseases and dementia-like illness, um, and then you're looking at MS, right, and all these other diseases, which it's very difficult to distinguish from Lyme, very difficult. I think you're probably looking at, you know, a global prevalence. I know I've seen evidence that they say five, six percent. I would estimate it's at least 10 percent or higher at this point from a global prevalence. Um, based on the fact that Lyme is probably imitating a lot of these other diseases. But again, from my perspective, it's never going to be Lyme alone. I am looking at environmental toxins. I'm looking at co-infections. Uh, I think there's a lot of other factors that drive an inflammatory response and have downstream effects. And unfortunately, the one cause, one disease model that a lot of governments are using, I think is outdated. I think we need to be looking at a multifactorial model in 21st century medicine if we're gonna solve these chronic disease epidemics. And Dr. Hertz, what do you believe, um, like, so that's a lot of blocks at the highest level in a way. What do you believe is the solution? What do you see as the way forward? So, if I wanted to prove, let's say, to the U.S. government that we had a lot more Lyme disease here, I would probably want to take a cohort of these people with preclinical dementia or Alzheimer's and do more studies. I'd want to take a cohort of the chronic fatigue fibromyalgia, do more studies, the autoimmune. Now, the, the, the publication that Dr. Freeman and I did several years ago where we validated the first statistically validated Lyme questionnaire, that costs no money. So, for example, if you're over 63, it's two standard deviations above the mean. So you could give out a questionnaire that costs no money. You could give it out to these people who say, I have chronic fatigue, I have fibromyalgia, I, I have memory loss, I have dementia, I have an autoimmune disease, I have MS. Give out this questionnaire to people, see what the pretest probability is before you test them, because obviously this would be an expensive proposition to test everyone. But take a look at those people that test high on the questionnaire, at least you know, 40, 40 or higher, which gives you a moderate to high probability. And then take a look, but using primers for Borrelia that are like the immunoblot that Igenix Laboratory has, where they're not just looking for one strain of Borrelia, but they're looking at at least seven different strains of Borrelia sensu latu, where they're looking at Borrelia sensu strictu and Borrelia garini and Borrelia afzeli and Valsana. You've got to look for a broad range of these Borrelia species if you're going to pick it up. So the solution for me is, use a much broader screen, but first do a pretest probability using an inexpensive questionnaire to see what is the probability that some people may have Lyme. And when you look at the constellation of symptoms, one of the things that is the hallmark of Lyme disease is that the symptoms come and go, you have good and bad days, and the pain, whether it's joint pain, muscle pain, or nerve pain, that tingling, numbness, um, stabbing sensation that people get, um, that is the hallmark of Lyme where these symptoms come and go and migrate around the body. There's only seven diseases that cause migratory pain. And most people are not going to have gonococcal arthritis or ulcerative colitis or hepatitis or a Reiter syndrome from a salmonella infection or acute rheumatic fever or lupus. There's only so many things that cause migratory pain. You should be able to do an adequate differential diagnosis and say, yeah, I have a patient who has good and bad days. The symptoms are coming and going. The pain is migrating around my body. Nerve pain, which migrates, has only been shown to be present in Lyme. That's a hallmark. So as a clinician, as an internist who's been doing this for over 30 years, that would tell me these are the patients I would want to test to get a global prevalence. And then you really want to start looking, for example, in Australia at what are all the species of Borrelia that are showing up here. Um, I know they, in the literature that I was looking at, um, I, and I can read you some of this. They found, for example, in Queensland and in Brisbane, they found spirochetes in blood films of the bandicots. Um, it was some type of Borrelia species. They didn't really know um, what species it was coming from. They thought it was likely to be a relapsing fever Borrelia. So, for example, it, it might be a relapsing fever, but one of the things we're finding in the U.S. is that the hard tick 
relapsing fever, which is Borrelia miyamotoi disease, you cannot pick that up on the standard Lyme testing. And in, on rare occasions, it causes an erythema migrans rash, not often, but it's in the literature. It can cause a Bell's palsy, it can cause a meningoencephalitis. So you might be dealing with relapsing fever Borrelia, um, but when you look at the birds, we know that these Sensulatu species, um, they're going across migratory songbirds in Canada. They're transmitting it from Asia to Japan. They found in the seabird Ixodes uriae, which is off, um, I guess, the Australia subcontinent, they found Borrelia garinii, which is the main species that causes Lyme neuroborreliosis in Europe. So, you know, someone's got to take a hard look at this, again, in the seabirds, um, because they are transmitting it across continents. Um, and the ticks along the Australian coast have not been investigated for Borrelia. Now, this is in the medical literature, right? So these are some of the studies that the Australian government could do. But Ixodes um, holocyclist, which is mainly the tick that is supposed to transmit in Australia, they're also finding the hosts like the wallabies, the kangaroos, the bandicoots, the possums, the dingoes. They're finding this tick um, is distributed in Queensland, uh, New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania. And what they're finding is that the geographic distribution of this particular tick coincides with exactly the Lyme-like disease cases that are reported in the scientific literature. So if you look at the literature of these over 500 cases in Australia that say, I, I didn't go outside Australia, I got a tick bite, I got an EM rash, it turns out that this species of ticks, um, Ixodes um, um, holocyclus, is turning out to be in exactly these places where the Australians are complaining of it. And they have found in the Northern hemisphere of Australia, that Borrelia sensulatu has been detected in the Xixodi species, but they're also detecting it, and this is really interesting, in lice, in fleas, in keds, in mites, in flies, in mosquitoes. This is like with Bartonella. They're describing Bartonella species also showing up, and they are finding Bartonella species in Australian ticks of unknown significance. Now, if you go to the laboratories in the US, like Galaxy or Igenex that are looking at these different species, we're not just talking like Bartonella hensile and Quintana, we're talking Bartonella vinsoni subspecies, Bartonella elizabethae. We're talking subspecies that cause illness, Lyme-like illness, that may be there, in fact, with even relapsing fever Borrelia. But until someone takes the time and effort and money to investigate this, you're just not going to have answers to it. But when, again, I looked at what is published in the journals for Australia, and this was published in the Medical Journal of Australia years ago, they took 167 ticks of Ixodes holocyclus and Haemophilus longicornis, which is the Asian bush tick that is now showing up in the US. They collected them from South Wales. Um, they looked at, for example, in the mid guts of these ticks, and they found motile spirochetal-like objects in 44% of the Ixodes holocyclus cultures, 35% of Haemophilus longicornis cultures, and they found these motile bacteria, these, they're coiled bacteria, uh, rotational movements, morphologically indistinguishable from Borrelia burgdorferi B31, and several of these isolates tested positive by ELISA, immunofluorescence, and Western blots. Now, so when you look at that kind of what's showing up in the medical literature in Australia, right, um, it's like, well, gee, it looks like you certainly have it there. The same ticks that are transmitting it, they're finding in the midguts, Another study that was done in 12,000 ticks along the New South Wales coast found among Ixodes holocyclus and Longicornis um, that they were finding again that 92 cultures of these ticks revealed these spirochetal-like objects. So they're finding it in the Australian ticks along with novel relapsing fever Borrelia. So, you know, we think the Ixodes ticks are the main ones that are going to transmit it, but Haemophilus longicornis has Lyme causing Borrelia in Japan, and you have that tick in Australia. So I think what's really needed at this point, um, especially when you look, and this is really interesting, this was published in your journals, that in Papua New Guinea, 50% of 84 people screened for Lyme Borreliosis fit the CDC serological criteria. Half of the people screened in Papua New Guinea. It, it's more and more evidence it's there. The problem is, is that they've not, you know, culturing Borrelia is not easy. You can culture it, but it's not always easy to do. And what we know now is when Borrelia is stressed out because of high environmental temperatures or starvation, it changes forms. And it changes forms into these 
um, L forms, S forms, round body forms, cystic forms, they're called many names. And then later you can grow them out in culture, right? So they're finding this inside the ticks in Australia. Um, but I think what you're probably gonna find if I was to you know, take my medical crystal ball, you're probably gonna find there are relapsing fever Borrelia on top of rickettsia, on top of Q fever, on top of Bartonella species that are causing Lyme-like illness in Australia. I don't think this is like, a, truthfully, a great scientific mystery that can't be solved, but you've gotta get a group of doctors and scientists and the Australian government together, take the money, look at the literature, because your literature basically suggests it's there. Your, your own story is, I got bit by a tick, I had an EM rash, I looked at the literature, there are other stories, exactly the same thing. It happened in Australia, they didn't travel to the US and other places. But of course, people do travel. So, you know, why wouldn't you look at answers even for the people who did travel outside Australia? They're still your people. You still have a responsibility to take care of Australians, whether they travel to other countries and got the disease. So I think there's just a mismatch because of the politics of this disease, that it's, you know, a dirty word to use the word chronic Lyme disease. You know, they don't allow Stanford University and other universities in the United States to even use this word. I mean, there's no other disease on the planet that has this kind of a political problem. And that's mainly because of the scientific controversies, but the way you get through it is science. And the way you get through it is compassion. And the way you get through it is put more money into the research, right? So that you can solve the problem. But there's a lot of researchers' reputations, at least here in the US, that are dependent on the, um, the titers are reliable and the bugs don't persist. And I can tell you from my personal experience and just looking at the literature, nothing could be further from the truth. So it's in Australia. I looked at your literature. I looked at what's been published. There's not even a doubt it's there. You just have to convince the Australian patients, the sick people in Australia, and this is by the way what they did in the United States, they showed up in the offices of the politicians, whether at the local level, the state level, or the federal level. The Lyme patients show up in the offices of these politicians, they tell them the stories, they come with the medical literature like the ones I just quoted, and they say, listen, we're sick and our government is not doing anything to help us, what can you do to help? You go directly to the politicians, you pull on the heartstrings. That's how you do this, right? This is not an insoluble problem. So Dr. Horowitz, in this, you've really beautifully outlined the scientific uncertainty to, one, to, to a degree. Is there, what do you, what's your comment around pa patients not getting treatment or actually in Australia, you can't even get healthcare or medical care here. Most, we've had um, 16 doctors stopped from treating Lyme. There's only three cities left where there, you can find someone. And obviously they're so busy, most of their books are closed. So in a situation like this, in, in the sense of scientific uncertainty or medical disagreement, I guess. Why? What's the human right for people in getting health care? See, the, the human rights from my perspective, and I think you're absolutely right bringing up this issue of human rights, um, medical boards across the world, um, not uniformly, and I think there's some changes happening, but a lot of times they've adopted the idea, say, uh, dogma, which is the tests are reliable and there's no evidence of persistence. So if you don't get better in 30 days of antibiotics, it can't possibly be Lyme. Well, if you really look carefully at the medical literature that you know, has been coming out in the last 10 years, you'll see that we have new evidence that of course it does persist because of these persister forms and biofilm forms. And that's what's giving me and my clinical practice the greatest success. So I do think from a human rights perspective, the medical boards in scientific uncertainty should not take sides in an issue. Because if you've got someone like myself that's worked with the US government, um, and you know, I've, I've had open-minded conversations with the CDC and other people in the government, and you know, fortunately, this HHS Tick-Borne Disease Working Group that was formed a couple of years ago when President Obama signed the 21st Century Cures Act, I think we've made a lot of progress because now we have the Tick Act that just passed in the United States. We're gonna get a lot more money. I think it's $150 million that's now gonna be devoted to more research. And that's essentially what we need. You know, we've had like a billion dollars for Zika virus, which is a problem, but it's not a problem of the same magnitude of what we're dealing with tick-borne. So I think from the point of view of scientific uncertainty, medical boards need to take a step back and go through a two standards of care. There's the IDSA standard of care, there's the ILAD standard of care, and doctors have the right to treat patients to the best of their ability. Especially if, if I can show you medical literature that's backing up my point of view, 
And again, I wouldn't even be following the ILADS point of view if it didn't work in clinical practice. There'd be no reason for me to be doing it, but it does work in clinical practice. And the ID doctors cannot tell you why these people are chronically ill. Now that's just not acceptable, not for a disease that's been out for over 40 years, where, for example, this past year in the US, you had at least 600,000 people getting sick from this. I mean, you're dealing with a global epidemic um, and with climate change and the fact that, I mean, in Australia, by the way, I've been tracking what's going on in Australia. You've got fires that are out going all across Australia in different parts. The rivers are drying up. The animals are dying. Um, I've looked at the horses dying on the side of the rivers in Australia, the bushfires that are breaking out, um, the plumes from Sydney that are coming out. Um, your Australian prime minister recently was in Hawaii and somebody was making a joke about this while the fires were burning in Australia. Um, and the Australian government was not taking any action in, in the COP25 summit that just took place in Spain. Australia was not doing anything. They're increasing their coal production during a time when climate change is clearly a worldwide disaster that every government needs to take seriously and no one is taking it seriously at this point. Everyone is putting it on you know, the back burner saying, we're gonna figure it out at some point, but every climate scientist I've spoken to has said, we have about eight or 10 years and if we don't start doing something fast, every year we wait, we're gonna to have to mitigate carbon dioxide by somewhere between seven to 10% a year and we don't even have the technology at this point to do this. So, you know, the, the world is burning and the world governments are sitting on the side saying, not my problem, let somebody else start. I mean, I'm personally herping in the next election, whoever gets elected and whatever the Congress is, is that both Republicans and Democrats that have come together and say, listen, we need to have a green deal and not just the Green New Deal, because there's issues with that alone. You have to look at what it's gonna to cost to pull all these minerals out of the ground to be able to do wind and solar and everything. But we need the best and brightest scientists from across the world to deal with it, because as climate change impacts Australia, and you start getting hotter and hotter, and I've seen heat waves in Australia that you guys have never seen before, the ticks, they're just gonna be spreading more and more. There was just an article this morning that just came out on climate change, which is driving part of the problems of the ticks, which are spreading across the world. So, you know, this is, everything is kind of interdependent at this point in time. You can't separate one thing from the other. Um, but I'm, I'm truthfully astonished that we don't have legislators worldwide in every country who are looking at the fact that the house is burning and everybody's playing cards and, and playing political games while patients are suffering and while we've maybe got about eight or 10 years to reverse this climate emergency, and at that point, you're gonna see millions and millions of displaced homeless refugees fleeing from country to country because there's no water, there's no food, they're not gonna be able to live in these areas. I mean, there's some really dire predictions that are being made. And the ticks is just one part of this whole problem. So again, how do you get people to sit down in your governmental level, look at what the climate data is, the uh, IPCC, Australia participated in it. One of your Australian scientists did a brilliant job for IPCC. I've read the reports. Um, I've read the United Nations reports. Um, Australia knows what's going on. It's just there's a disconnect just like there is here and in many of the countries across the world that people aren't taking this seriously enough um, while we've really got a big problem on our hands. Let's go back to diagnosis and testing, Dr. Horowitz. Um, so in Australia, you may be familiar with the fact that uh, for the diagnostic, the diagnostic criteria for overseas acquired Lyme, they removed the Aretha Migrin's um, rash from that criteria, citing the fact that Australian doctors don't know how to diagnose the rash. Um, what, what is best practice in regards to diagnosis? Um, that makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever because it's always been determined that an erythema migrans rash is basically evidence of Lyme disease, whether you have positive testing or not. That's always held up in the United States, it's well known. Now, there are some uh, problems sometimes because there are other species, like rarely Borrelia miyamotoid disease can cause an EM rash from a different Borrelia species. Star eye, which is in the United States in Missouri in the Southwest, can cause an EM type rash. But it makes no scientific sense to me why they would have taken that off as a criteria because it's well known that that's indicative of Borreliosis. So I'm, I'm not quite sure truthfully why they did it, uh, but that's like saying Australian doctors uh, can't diagnose acne because they can't figure out what a zit looks like. 
Um, Australian doctors can't diagnose eczema because they can't figure out what a scaly red rash on your hands looks like. I mean, I'm sorry, what am I missing here? Um, now again, with bullseye rashes, they're not all bullseye. Half of those rashes do not look like bullseyes. They look like spreading red rashes, which could be confused with a cellulitis, a bacterial infection, or a spider bite. Um, but I don't understand the logic behind it at all. I think it's a big mistake. And so what is best practice for diagnosing? So Lyme has always been a clinical diagnosis. If you go on the CDC website right now and you look it up and you go back to 2008, 2011, 2017, just go on and look it up, the CDC website says Lyme disease is a clinical diagnosis, right? The testing is only supposed to support a clinical diagnosis because the testing is primarily for health departments to epidemically screen large patients' populations. It's a clinical diagnosis made by a doctor. How do you make that diagnosis? The symptoms come and go. You have good and bad days. The pain migrates, right? There's a constellation of symptoms that is classic for Lyme borreliosis, absolutely classic. And again, there's only seven diseases that cause migratory pain. And in the study that we published a couple of years ago, over 90% of these patients had migratory pain, the hallmark of Lyme. So when you say it's a clinical diagnosis, how do you make it? It's like, well, there really are certain very clear clinical criteria of how to diagnose this disease. Right? So for example, migraines. Is there a blood test for migraines? No. Would you say to a patient coming in with light sensitivity, with nausea and vomiting, and half of their head hurting that need to be in a dark room, they're making it up, and that they don't have a migraine? Of course you wouldn't. You would say, you have a migraine. We don't have blood tests for migraines, but you don't say patients are making it up. And we don't know what to do. What about Parkinson's disease? Can you make a clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's disease? and give people Cinemet? Of course you can. Is there a blood test for Parkinson's disease? Absolutely not, there is not. It's a clinical diagnosis. So it's not like the first time in medicine we've ever seen a disease where you make a clinical diagnosis until science kind of catches up and we have other biological markers to help with that making that diagnosis. Thank you, and what about testing? There's a lab in Australia where um, they're getting quite, a, according to the Lyme treating doctors, they're getting quite a few positives out of that lab. But they say, unless the patient has a travel history, that it's a false positive until it's identified in a tick, these pathogens. So I know testing is problematic everywhere. And what's the best practice with using testing as part of the diagnostic process? So um, usually what I suggest for best practicing is what's called a panel approach, because unfortunately, Lyme disease patients do not always make antibodies. In the study that we just published earlier this year in the International Journal of General Medicine, we found that 7% of our patients had chronic variable immune deficiency. They did not have immunity to be able to even make antibodies. Um, and a very large percentage of those cases were had immunoglobulin subclass one and three deficiencies, which you need those subclasses to fight the infection, to phagocytize it, to kind of eat the bacteria and get rid of it. They were missing it because they found with Lyme disease, it affects how the immune system functions. A lot of these Lyme patients are not making IgG antibodies. They make IgM. And this was previously shown in the mouse model in Nicole Baumgarth at the University of California that when Borrelia invades the body and hits the lymph nodes, it, you get a T cell independence where the mice might, make, might not make IgG antibodies, they make IgM. We found the same thing in our patients where about 45% of our patients had positive CDC IgM Western blots. A lot of the uh, other doctors from the other side will say it's a false positive, but it's not. It's actually a marker of chronic Lyme. In fact, John Alcott from John Hopkins published very similar, exactly the same numbers several years before. So best practice is panel approach. Antibodies would be not just an ELISA, but a C6 ELISA, which is Borrelia zelae and Gurinae, right, with the sensu a strict two species, but also an immunofluorescent antibody right? So you might need to look at an IFA, an ELISA, a C6 ELISA. Um, you may need to look at different antibody testing. But again, from the Western blot perspective, um, we need immunoblots that check for all these different strains. So until you actually take the strains of Borrelia that are present in Australia and put them in a Western blot and check patients, then you'll have a much better sense. And again, they did this in Scotland years ago and found that the sensitivity and specificity of their Western blots improved. So best testing practice in Australia should actually be take the Borrelia strains you have, including, by the way, the relapsing fever Borrelia you're finding there, 
test these patients and find out how many of them make antibodies, but you also need PCR, right? It's not highly reliable in blood. You're probably not gonna get it back more than 10, 20% of the time. Uh, you can sometimes find it in tissues. Culture is difficult, possible, but it, it's difficult to culture the organism. But we're finding fish, uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization, RNA testing, there's a lot more RNA in the body than DNA. Fish will sometimes pick up, uh, for example, Babesia or Bartonella or other species that we can't pick up by antibodies or PCR. So panel approach from my standpoint is you've got to do a broad range of antibody testing and look at PCR and look at fish with RNA. Um, and, and again, always do a differential diagnosis. If somebody's presenting with a set of symptoms, the biggest thing I ever learned in medical school was do a differential diagnosis. You should come up with multiple possibilities of what is making this patient sick and one by one go down the list to eliminate it. So best practice always has to be differential diagnosis with a panel approach. Um, but you can't really say, gee, you're sick and we don't know. It means you just, you need to look harder. There's always an answer, right? If you really stick with it and you put your best and your brightest uh, scientists in Australia together, I'm sure you're going to figure this out. Mm. That's such a good point, you know, because again, I believe that we have a human right to have Lyme and associated conditions included as part of our differential diagnosis for all these people with MS, the conditions you've mentioned, MS, Alzheimer's, dementia, you know, pain, chronic fatigue. Some of the chronic fatigue support groups are quoting that when they're open to being evaluated with Lyme included as part of their differential, up to 50% of them actually have a stealth pathogen illness that is treatable, isn't it? Correct. Correct. So, and you know, and you and you do have Babesia species showing up in Australia. Mm. You of course have rickettsiosis they've known for a long time. But the big one, and again, I'll point this out, it's gonna probably be Bartonella. Um, every you know, doing this long enough, I can tell you it's these kind of occult Bartonella species that no one is testing for. They do cause Lyme like illness. If you look at the literature that's been published in the US um, a while back by Dr. Moziani and Dr. Breishwert and the rest. Um, a large percent of these people with rheumatological symptoms in Lyme endemic areas test positive for Bartonella. You know, it, it's showing up in, in our study, it was 46.5%. In the study they published, I think it was 46.4%. A recent study we just did, which hopefully will be published next year, 70% of our patients who were chronically ill with high scores on the horowitz emsitz questionnaire, 70% were testing positive for Bartonella. So I think you're going to find probably because you do have a whole host of Bartonella that no one's even identified yet in Australia. You've got to start doing much better PCR and speciation to figure out what are the species. And if I was the Australian government, I would call up Ed Reichward, who's one of the, you know, the veterinary experts across the world on Bartonella. Get him involved to help the Australia government. I'm sure he'd be happy to do it. Fantastic. I, and I, can't speak, I can't speak for Ed. I can just tell you he's a hell of a nice guy and he probably would help. <laughs> um, so one other thing I wanted to highlight was that, you know, I've heard uh, international doctors mention that Australians that travel overseas for their medical care are some of the sickest they treat. Is that your experience? You know, I have obviously seen very sick Australian patients, but the problem in giving you an answer to that is I haven't really seen enough of them to really give you a broad global statement because um, like I have patients coming from Pennsylvania, a couple of states over from New York, and they are some of the sickest people I've ever seen, but they're also people that test positive for uh, Babesia and very strange Bartonella strains that show up. So, you know, when I think about the patients that are the sickest who come to see me, the rule of thumb for those patients is they generally not only have Lyme, but they generally have co-infections. Most of the time it's, it's parasitic like Babesia and a Bartonella species. They usually have immune deficiency. They usually have environmental toxins. Uh, they usually have microbiome abnormalities. They're not sleeping. And they usually have the downstream effects of the inflammatory response from Lyme, which is the hormones are off, their adrenals are off, you know, their mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, they have POTS dysautonomia. In other words, the 16-point MSIDS model, which took me 30 years to develop, if you were to really, and this is what I was suggesting to the Australian government years ago, if I have a chronically ill patient and I don't know what's wrong with them, I'm gonna take the approach of taking the 16 point model and I'm gonna apply it to this patient and see what I find. So if I have a patient, for example, that's still really ill, and let's say they've done Dapsone, or they've done Disulfiram, or they've done some of these new persister drugs, and they're still sick, and they're still complaining of really bad symptoms. Well, what I found is once you go in and you start hitting these bugs, they get pissed off. 
you'll sometimes see a worsening of symptomatology if you don't keep up and keep treating these people. But you've also got to make sure, especially in the sickest of people, you're not dealing with the co-infections like BART because we're finding that the treatment for Bartonella differs from the treatment that we need for Lyme. There's a couple of little basic differences in how we have to do it, including Bartonella persisters were just published this year by John Hopkins University, where you may have to use methylene blue. Rifampin is used for actively growing Bartonella. But in other words, you've got to treat these people differently. So if I was the Australian government, they were hiring me as a consultant saying, you know, we've got these hundreds of patients in Australia, and we just don't know what to do with them. My answer would be apply the 16 point model, but make sure you're going through the model carefully, looking for these Bartonella species and Babesia species and other forms of relapsing fever, all of these other things. You know, some of the doctors may not have even checked for Coxiella burnetta Q fever, which is known to be in Australia, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't really know, you know, until I was to look at every chart of one of these patients, I can pretty much guarantee you they probably miss some of the parasites, the viruses, the bacteria, they haven't looked at the downstream effects, but I've never seen anything outside the 16-point MSIDS model in all the years that I've been doing this. Um, so that's where I would start if I was the Australian government trying to figure out how to help these patients. Fantastic. And I know this tick season, uh, just at our inbox, we've had seven kids come across the, our desk with um, bullseye rashes after playing near bush or in their backyard or whatever. And you know, I've phoned and phoned and phoned to get them a doctor just trying to find something, something somewhere. Some of them are traveling long distances. And what do you say to the families and even some of the doctors are out there who, who can recognize there's a real cognitive dis dissonance? What's your message to them? While we're, we're really medically abandoned here in Australia, what's your message to them in the short term? So, um, again, for example, if you look at the HIV epidemic and how it finally got recognition in the States, it was basically the patients. The patients were loud, they were vocal, and by the way, the patients knew the science way better than the government scientists at the time early on. They were the ones that had to inform the government and scientists as far as where the research is and how we move along. It's gonna be the same thing here. It is beyond ridiculous that you're getting bullseye type rashes in Australia and they're ignoring it with these people getting sick. I mean, that is medical abandonment. Um, and that is just from a human rights perspective that is absolutely not acceptable because then you're subjecting people to a lifelong um, suffering that they could have had an answer. Um, you know, whereas they're able to give one or two years of doxycycline for acne because you've got zits, but they're not willing to give a longer term doxycycline for a bullseye rash and stop long term suffering. That makes absolutely no sense to me, especially when every other government across the world has admitted that bullseye type rashes are pathognomonic of Lyme. Right? Again, realizing there may be other species of Borrelia that can also cause it, not just Borrelia sensu stricto. Um, so I think the patients need to speak up. As I said earlier, go to your local, your state, your federal politicians. I don't know how the system works in Australia, but I know what patients in the United States have done. And it's always the squeaky wheel you know, that, that gets attention. You've got to go to these politicians and explain how the lives have been basically ruined at this point by this disease and the fact that you've got to put money into not just better diagnostics, but better treatments, right? So it shouldn't be up to doctors like myself in the trenches who are trying to figure out the last part of this. I mean, I think I've clinically discovered the cure for Lyme. I'm not saying a microbiological cure where every bacteria is gone, but I now have many patients who are sick for decades who are no longer sick after double dose Dapsone for like eight to 12 weeks. So why isn't a government taking this and running with it and going, hey, let's check it out. I'm willing to show you how to do the studies, right? My biggest problem truthfully is Bartonella. These people that have these severe neurological symptoms that aren't getting better, I'm finding Bartonella is a lot of times kind of below the radar. And if I'm finding it, sit down with me and give me your best scientists and let's have an open dialogue, right? So the answer is always gonna be communication, looking at the scientific literature, putting money into new scientific research, but it's gotta be open-mindedness, it's gotta be compassion, and it's gotta be patients standing up and saying this is a human rights violation. You cannot treat this this way. If your daughter or your son got sick with this, would you really treat them the same way? No, you would not. Mm -hmm. And Dr. H, what's in your heart to leave uh, sick Australians with today? Um, there is hope because I am seeing answers for this disease. I can't tell you in Australia exactly the answer, but I can pretty much guarantee you that the formula that has worked 
in the United States was once the 21st Century Cure Act got, pub got passed and we had both sides come to the table, people from the IDSA standpoint, people from the ILAD standpoint, like myself, people from the CDC, the NIH, once everyone came together at the table, then all of a sudden the TIC Act is, pub you know, is now going to become law in the United States and we have a lot more money for research and the NIH for the first time has a much more comprehensive plan for dealing with Lyme, but it only happened when both sides came to the table and had an open discussion. And again, if you go on the hhs.gov double slash uh, tick-borne disease working group and you read the document that we gave to Congress and you read the subcommittee reports, it's a very comprehensive overview of what's now been found in diagnostics and testing and persistence and um, even human rights, you'll find access to care. So for example, if the access to care is a problem in Australia, I would go to the hhs.gov website, look up the subcommittee report with access to care because it's gonna describe exactly the same situation you're probably dealing with in Australia and see what the solutions are um, that the subcommittee came up with here for the US government. Um, I think you could use that as the lead, but I think more than anything, you have to speak up and you've got to bring science to the table. As I said, I read the literature before getting on the call with you today. There's a fair amount of literature that is showing that you've got a problem with Borrelia in Australia and not just Borrelia, guaranteed you've got Bartonella species and other things making people sick. So the answer is don't just say you don't have a solution, put time and effort and money into it and let the Australian government show people that you care. And not just that you care from a compassionate standpoint, but you're ultimately gonna save the healthcare system money because chronic diseases right now are 70% of the healthcare costs in the US and 86% of the deaths. So chronic diseases, Lyme and tick-borne disorders, as well as environmental toxins and other things are driving a lot of these chronic disease epidemics worldwide. And I'm sure in Australia, you're seeing a rise in chronic diseases and the cost to the Australian government that they're trying to figure out how do we keep down healthcare costs. You've got to shift the paradigm. You can't use the same paradigm you've been using to address the problem. And the paradigm shift that I think is needed is in this editorial that I published about 10 days ago um, in Scientific Archives, where I'm basically calling for a multifactorial paradigm shift in dealing with chronic diseases where tick-borne disorders and environmental toxins are now considered in the mix. And those are two factors that if you look at the way Australian doctors and many world governments are looking at it, they're really not including tick-borne disorders and toxins right into the mix of chronic disease. Yet if you just read this two-page article, uh, which has I think about 100 references I have in it, you'll see it's pretty convincing at this point that we really should be shifting the paradigm and taking a look at tick-borne illness and environmental toxins to look at a different paradigm for these chronically ill patients. It's time for a paradigm shift. It's gonna help keep down costs. It's gonna help keep down suffering. I think it's the best solution you can probably come up with at this point. Dr. Horowitz, God bless you. Thank you so very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the first of a short series over this Christmas and holiday season that we're going to bring to you with from a, few, a, a global view, international perspective, our situation here in Australia. So hang in there. Stay strong. We're not stopping fighting for you and for all of us. Dr. Hortz, have a great weekend. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you and happy holidays and, and blessings to everyone. Thank you.